Welcome to another edition of the Sim Racing Garage. I'm Barry Rowland. In this episode, we'll be reviewing the new version 2 McLaren GT3 replica wheel from the guys at Fanatec. With some nice upgrades like the Toolist quick release system and magnetic shifter action, and now Fanatec is officially approving its use on their direct drive podium series wheelbases with the proper quick release attached. Time to put it through the SRG's review process and see how it does. So let's get to it. So let's take a closer look at the McLaren GT3 version 2 wheel from the guys at Fanatec. Right out of the box, no surprises. It looks exactly like the version 1. And you wouldn't think there'd be any differences because this is an officially licensed from McLaren GT wheel. So it's supposed to look just like the one that's in the car. And so, yeah, they're not going to change that. Now, the grip is a rubber grip. They call it an overmolded rubber grip. And it's good as far as bare hand goes. It, it doesn't slip at all. You get a good grip on it. I did use some gloves on it that I, that I have, and it was compatible with those too. It wasn't so slippery that some rubber grips, they're so slippery that my gloves won't work on them. You have to have your bare hand on it. But this is not. This has kind of a, I don't want to call it sticky feel to it, but it, a tacky, kind of a tacky feel to it, even though it's not really tacky. I like the rubber they're using on this, actually. Yeah, I like using a glove because, you know, the high forces of direct drive wheel definitely get some calluses in your hand pretty quick using something like this. And the gloves help mitigate that a lot when you're using it. Feels good in hand. Again, I always like the grip on this McLaren GT3 replica wheel. I've never really had anything against this wheel. Now, it is their entry-level elite wheel, but it kind of punches above that. And when you grab this and try to twist it, it feels pretty darn stiff. There's no obvious flex in it, which I like about this wheel. But you can see the, the casements are pretty beefy on this. So, yeah, it does a good job. The only area of flex is right here, and that's when it's connected to the steering wheel or the wheelbase itself, and that's not surprising. You know, I can make it move there, but everywhere else is pretty darn stiff. And it doesn't feel as good as some, like on some of the custom real race wheels that I have as far as when I'm driving it because of the plastics and stuff that this is made of. But, you know, for what it is, it definitely, I think, punches above its weight a little bit in the fuel department. The typical carbon, fake carbon fiber on here. Again, this is all plastic. And we have a nice silk screen here for the McLaren GT3 logo. And of course, we have the buttons going around. We'll start with this seven-way funky. We only get one of these. I wish they would put another one over there, but I always say that. <laughs> you know, it's seven moves in one position. That would be nice to have another one of these over there. But then again, this board may not accommodate enough button inputs to have another one over there. So again, funky switches are nice. I really like these. You can go left, you can go right, you can go up, you can go down. You can do the encoder function. And of course, we can push it. It's a push button. Above that, we have the usual standard CSL Elite type buttons. Nothing special here. Not, a hard, not hard to press them. You can hear there is a little click to it. It's a muted click. But basically, when you're using these kind of buttons, at least when I am, I'm just whacking the button and, yeah, just to the stop till it won't go down anymore. I know I pressed it. The buttons over here, the big ones, these are supposed to be exactly like what's in the McLaren wheel or on the McLaren wheel. And they certainly are a different animal than these buttons. If you press down on this button, it takes some force. You've got to be in, you've got to have intent to push it, to push it. You can hear it. That's a, that's a pretty loud click there. And then over here, the same way. So you're not going to accidentally brush across one of these and hit it because you've got to really say, I'm going to push you because <laughs> it's that stiff. <laughs> totally different animal than what's down here. And of course, they did that intentionally so it feels like the real buttons in the real McLaren wheel. So I think they've accomplished that if that's what it feels like because it certainly is stiff. And I've been, I put a few hours on this wheel and the stiffness has not gone away. I thought maybe they'll break in a little bit, but yeah. It's still the same pretty much heavy feel to them. And they've got these little shrouds around them too, so you don't accidentally brush your finger against it and press the button, but I can't see that happening considering how hard it is to press them to begin with. The switches up here, we have two momentary switches up and down. Over here, some more inputs. And we have these rotaries over here. And they are continuous rotaries. We can keep spinning these round and round and round to select whatever you want. They, have, they are numbered. They go from one... Do a little one in there. 
and then they go all the way up to, I believe it's 12. Yeah, where's 12? There it is. So 12 is down there next to 1. And you can map whatever you want to to these buttons. Then we have the center selector. And this will select different modes in our little screen here, a little one-inch screen. And it has an A, B, C, and D on it. Now at A position, it, it deals with what's going on with these back here, these clutches or these paddles, if you will. They don't have to be clutches. So in the A position, it's the clutch bite point mode. So this is where we'll come in and set up our bite point on our clutches. And typically what we'll do with that is you'll have the right set as your bite point. Then we'll come in with our left like this and let the rest of it out when we get going. And I'll demonstrate that when we're actually using this wheel. So the switch, when you take it to B, we'll set it to clutch and handbrake. That means and it actually points to the clutch being over here on the left-hand side, handbrake over on the right-hand side. So you can use the clutch and then use this as your handbrake as far as if you were going to do any dirt driving or something like that, I would imagine. And then if we take it over to C, this turns into the brake on the left hand and the throttle on the right, which is similar to like driving a motorcycle or an ATV or something like that. Right, throttle is usually over here on the right, and then you can use the brake as a, as a regular brake. So you can drive without your feet, basically. So you can use the throttle. And I actually did this, and <laughs> you'll see it in the video. I've seen how good I could get with it. But uh, I could see where if you practice a lot with this, you could drive pretty fast because it's the only thing is the brake is the hardest thing to, to learn. And that's because it's just a, you know, it's not a pressure thing anymore. You're just pulling on a handle. And they do have good spring resistance in them. But let's say I don't want the throttle over here and the brake over here, right? On the, on the left, yeah, your left. I want to go over to D, and D is mappable analog axis. And that's exactly what it means. You can do whatever you want to in that position. So whatever the game you're in, and you're calibrating or setting up your throttle and your brake and whatever else, you could actually come in and say, I want this to be the brake, the right hand, and the left. By simply, when it gets to the throttle, pull the left one instead of the right one. And then when it goes to brake, you pull the right one over here. So then you've reversed it. Or you can map whatever you want to to those using this, as far as when you're in this mode of mappable analog axis. So a lot of functionality on the paddles there. And it really works well. In fact, I've got some video I'm going to show you guys as part of the review when I'm driving it and show you just how easy it is to set things up. It really works like a champ. I didn't have any problems with it, which is nice. So on the back, of course, the first thing we see is the rocker shifter assembly. And it works quite well. It has that grain on it that has pretty good grip. And you never will ever slip on this grip, I think, glove or otherwise. It really sticks on your finger. It's not sharp or anything, but it definitely has some good grip on it. Try to give you guys a better look at it there. As well as these paddles back here. They have good grip on them too. Now these are magnetic shifters. So they do have a, a different feel, I think, than the originals. They have definitely are more audible. So, yeah, they feel crispy. Not real crisp, but crispier than the shifters on some of their other Fanatec wheels, actually, because obviously it doesn't have any rubber bumpers or dampers in it, like some of the shifters in other wheels that are in the Fanatec lineup. So, what else have we talk about here? They feel pretty good. I might take this apart and just see what's going on as far as underneath. It's hard to see what's going on. There is supposed to be a magnet. I think this part is the magnet. Well, you see that silver piece in there? I think that may be the magnet, but I can't be sure. And the switch looks like, let me pull this one up here on this side. See those little two pieces you can see there? That may be the switch, but we're going to, obviously when I do a look inside, I'll be able to tell for sure which one's which. They have a decent feel to them. You know, the rocker type of shifter is just, you know, something you get used to. I'm, I'm not a real big fan of it because I, I like an individual shifter but it doesn't cause you not to be able to use it just as well as regular independent ones. It's just one of those things that sometimes I'll have my hand back here resting on something and when it's kind of foreign, you know, if you've been using separate shifters, you pull one and the other, your, your hand gets moved on the other side. But again, it's just something you can adapt to, no problem. Now, there's good spring pressure on these analog paddles. 
I do like that. Too soft and they're just no good. You got to have some pressure on these things for them to work like they should. And yeah, it really works good. I never had a problem with that as far as the feel. And I appreciate that they put some stronger springs in this to achieve that. Of course, the main thing that sticks out to us here is this quick release system, right? This is the new tool-free quick release from Fanatec. And I've already done a review showing this quick release. It was on the W, was it the World Rallycross Championship wheel that they have? And now we have, it's obviously, this is what's going to be on all the wheels coming forward now as far as CSL goes. This is their fiberglass reinforced type of plastic special mix that they make on their plastics. And it's very easy to use. As you can see, it's got some arrows down here. I'll flip it around so you can see it in the right orientation. So to lock it, we're going this way. And what that does is these little leaves in here, it squeezes down on those leaves on the shaft of the wheelbase motor as we tighten it down, right? And then unlock it, we go the other way and it will take the pressure off of them. And if you can watch down here, there's a little indicator. See that white piece? And as I lock it, it goes away. So you can look down quickly and see if you're locked or if you're in the unlock position. So it's nice they put a little indicator in there for that. Anything else here I want to talk about? Oh yeah, something else you don't see on the version 2 that you saw on the version 1 because we had this new quick release. Remember the old one had that metal band around it of metal, right? Springy metal. And it had that little latch piece that you put the bolt in, you tighten it down, and that's how you put it on. This is so much better than that. I'm telling you, this is... Yeah, I'm so glad that Fanatec finally came out with something that I agree with as far as the, the quick release system on this CSL stuff. I never really liked the band, even though it worked. Uh, yeah, I just wasn't really comfortable with it. And if you notice here, this is flat. There used to be, on the version 1, a piece that actually went into this hole. See how that cut out is? Well, it's not cut out anymore. And I'll, I'll show you a quick clip of that. You pull that thing out and you open it up. And inside it had a, I believe it was a five millimeter, maybe in a four. But anyway, it had a hex wrench in it. And the hex wrench was used, you put the, to tighten and loosen the bolt. So it fit right on the bolt that we used to lock down our ring to do the quick release, if you will. I have to call it a quick release. That's just a, an attaching mechanism. There's nothing quick about it. But yeah, that's gone now. Obviously, we don't need it anymore. So there you go. And the wheel's probably a little lighter because it doesn't have that in there. So that's the obvious differences. Now, they actually say on their site that you can run this on a podium wheel. It says it's compatible with it, pretty much in those words, which is nice. They're confident that this can take the forces. Now, have they made it different inside to be able to do that? Remember, I ran my old one, the version one, on one of the podium wheels, and it did fine. But I did have to change out the... In fact, I didn't change out this. I think I cut the little thing, the little piece in on these type of quick releases that tell the wheel and the motor that you can't run this in high torque mode. <laughs> so we're going to get around that also this time because I have, and you can, anybody can do this, you guys can buy the Club Sport quick release, right, and put this on, and we're going to do that instead of this. It's very easy, just six bolts there, and we'll go over that in the video, of course. And once we do that, then the wheelbase does not see this as an Elite Series wheel anymore. It sees it as a regular wheel, and you can enable high torque just like you normally would on a club sport or podium series type of steering wheel. But we'll get to that when we get there. So again, not a lot new to see here, but again, I don't think they would want to change it much because it's a good looking wheel. It's stiff enough to do the job and give yourself a good experience as far as when you're driving with it. And for any kind of open wheel, GT wheel type of car that you're driving, this kind of wheel would, will do well, I think, at least for me, in my opinion. I think this is kind of the only wheel you need. This and an, and an oval wheel for dirt stuff is probably the only two wheels you would ever really need to have a blast just doing your sim racing stuff. Right, so we'll just get on to the next segment. Now I'm going to configure the GT3 wheel so that we can run it on our podium direct drive wheelbases and still use high torque mode. And I'll show you when I take this off what the differences are and why it won't work with this on here. Now I'm going to take a four mil wrench here to undo these six bolts 
that are holding all this on. Bear with me here as I do this. All right, so we have it loose now, and there are six of these socket head cap units holding that on. They're 20 millimeters long, and they're M5 bolts, and they have this little washer on there. You don't want to lose that when you take it off. And now this hub will come straight off. Now the middle section where the pins are, that stays on. It's attached to the rest of the wheel, so you just kind of gently take that off. And you can see now we have it exposed. Now, you want to make sure you don't bump this into anything. Right? You don't want to mess up your pins here. And yes, you can see some of these pins are shorter or longer than the others are. And that's on purpose, <laughs> in case you were wondering. Now, this is the reason why with this hub on there, it won't work in high torque mode on a podium. That is this little nub sticking out. Now this nub will go into this hole here, right there, all right? And as it goes in there, I use a bolt to do this, it pushes another button or switch in there. Hear it? Now that switch is what allows you or doesn't allow you <laughs> to run this wheel in high torque mode. Now, you could, now we're going to put this on here. This is Club Sport Quick Release. It's all steel and metal, right? On aluminum. Or you could just cut that off then you wouldn't have to worry about it anymore, right? But then you could never take it back to OEM either. So it's one of those considerations. But you could just, and I've done that. I've just cut the thing off, and it worked fine. Didn't, didn't cause any issues. So depends on what you want to do. But I'm going to use this Club Sport Quick Release. And when you put this on, you want, just want to make sure that's oriented on the right way. You don't want to get it backwards and have to take it back off when you figure out you've got it on backwards. And that is easy to see. See this key in here? And there is a corresponding keyway on the top of the shaft on the direct drive wheel bases. So that's the top. All we have to do is make sure that I'm on the top of the wheel when I put this on here, right? So this will fit right in here. And again, we're nice and smooth here, so we don't have anything activating our switch inside of there. Pretty simple stuff, really. It just drops right in. And then we'll go ahead and put our bolts back in. And again, I will speed this up so you guys don't have to sit here and watch me do it. All right, so we got them in. I'm just going to snug them up. I'll do my little cross pattern here while I'm doing this. I'm not going to get them real tight because you don't need to. And there's also these threads are plastic inserts. So you don't want to pull one out accidentally. <laughs> that would ruin your day. I mean, you could probably still use the wheel with five of them, but still. Nice not to break things if, if you don't have to. And there you have it. Very simple. Now we're just going to put it on like we do a club sport. And what we'll do next is, yeah, just go ahead, get it mounted, and see what it looks like. So we have the GT3 wheel mounted now. Looking good. And as you can see, go up here and give you a closer shot, that you can see we are indeed in high torque mode. And yeah, this all aluminum club sport piece here on the aluminum shaft adapter. Yeah, very solid through here, but there is a little flex down here in the plastic. I could feel that when I was testing it, sitting in here and testing it. But again, that's not something that I am surprised to see because it is, at the end of the day, still an Elite Series wheel. Of course, the real test is how is it going to feel when we are actually driving the car with 20 newton meters of force on it. <laughs> I do like the way this wheel feels in hand. And yeah, so we'll just go ahead and get in and start driving. Now it's time for our look inside segment for this version 2 of their McLaren GT3 wheel. Now, there are a few things you're going to have to take off to get this cover off and see what's going on inside. First off, we have, let's see, it was 4, 5, 6, 7, 8... I think that's 10. Yeah. So there's 10 of these screws here. And these are T10 Torx bits. You can see the pattern there. It's got a little Torx bits pattern. And it is the 
coarse plastic threaded bits. We've got 10 of those to take out, first thing. Then we have to remove these knobs, and they just slide off. But you have to do that carefully and properly, or you could snap them. And underneath those knobs, you're going to find a lock washer like this and a nut like that that go on the threaded pieces. I'll show you right here. See how they have threads on these? And the same thing for these momentary switches. See down in there, you can see the threaded bits down there. And they also have these very small nuts and lock washers. Oop. <laughs> Very small, <laughs> hard to keep them in your hands. So you can see those. So all that has to be taken off. And of course, they're hiding under the boots for the switches. All this has to be taken off to access the panel or access what's inside. And I'm just gonna pull this off. Now you notice the buttons are missing and the display is missing currently on the wheel. I had to remove those and I'll discuss that as I go along here. So I'm just gonna kind of pull this off We'll get a look at this on the inside, and you can see this is all of our buttons assemblies here. Now these big buttons, the neutral and the park, these go in also in here. They'll go in, let's see, I forget which one was which. I think the neutral was over here, and just slide into there. But the reason I took that out is because as soon as you start pulling this panel away, they fall out anyway. These don't fall out as easily. They kind of, they're kind of stuck in there because of the caps are on them. See those caps? Take the caps off, they would fall out. But these just fall out, so that's why I took them out. And we'll take a look at the back here of the board. And of course, this is just injection molded plastic. Nothing special here, not much to see. And I'll go ahead and put this panel over here. Nice and careful. Don't want to mess anything up. Now, here's the display. It shows us our menu and settings and such. If I give you guys a close look at this, around the back, you can see that's where most of the circuits are, or the circuitry components. You can see our little ribbon cable here that goes in, back over to, I'll show you this way, flip it back around, and that's what's powering the actual display. And on the back, of course, we have a four pin plug, and this plugs into the board. Now, Normally I wouldn't take this off, but I had to because of the way the injection mold and plastic on the back piece is, the supports for this display, put that out of the way, are sitting right in here. So you can see these little four pieces here, that's what it bolts to. Well, it kind of rides on these two, but it screws into these two. And if I, you can see if I move the circuit board, they don't move. So I had to take it off to get the rest of it off. And down here, we have the paddle, the analog axis, and that is a potentiometer in there. I don't think you guys are going to be able to see this. You might be able to if I can get the camera focused properly. But it might, you might be able to see it move just a little bit. It doesn't move very much, but it's a little mini potentiometer there. Proprietary circuitry stuff from Fanatec. And this is our Xbox button over here. And this little darter circuit board that has a cable coming from it over underneath, goes underneath and comes back out over here and connects to the board right next to our, let's see what side is that, right side, analog axis. And of course we have another one over here doing the same thing, not as quite as visible though, but yeah, doing the same thing. And over here we have our seven way switch and the little daughter board that handles that and the connectivity of the cable going over to our main board. Again, very neat and tidy here. These are the shifter, I'm calling them modules, or circuits, if you will. And this is what the magnetic shifters are pushing on. And the reason I took this apart this far is so I could show you that. And we have another one over here. So I'm going to go ahead and let this come off very gently. Before I do that, here's the buttons for the these big black buttons. The ones that are supposed to feel just like the McLaren steering wheel with the hard shift on them. And they are tough to push. And they're a metal film type button. But when you push on this, you can hear that not that it's very loud and very stiff. So that's how they do that. So now we can go ahead and pull this off very carefully. 
I'm just going to tilt it down. We'll go over some things that we can see here. This is the spring that is on the switch that when we put this quick release on this plastic one you see back here, remember it has that stem coming off of it that goes in that hole. Well, it pushes against this, and that's the switch that tells us whether or not we have a hub on the back of this that will be able to enable the high torque mode on the podium basis. So that's what that is. Now over here, we have the magnetic paddles. And when you push those, see if you can see that. See how it comes, pops up? So that has a magnet on it, and it has this plastic bushing piece in here, or just a plastic post. It's kind of rubbery feeling, very soft. But you can see that I'm separating the magnet when I push it down, and then the magnet pulls it back with a click. And on our circuit board, right across from that, is this guy here. You remember, that's that little black piece in here, that little circuit I was talking about, that little black box. And that will press on this little button here. Very easy to push. Now, I don't know if you can hear it. It's a little teeny switch in there. Hopefully you heard that. <laughs> but yeah, that's how it works. And I was curious how they were doing that. Because I knew it was magnetic and I could see the circles from the outside if you saw the closer look. But yeah, I was trying to figure out just how they did that. And another thing, I wanted to see what they were doing with the hub section. As far as, you know, they're saying you can use this with a direct drive podium wheel. And I don't see anything special going on with the reinforcements, but I could be wrong. It could be a little thicker back there, and I just don't, you know, it's just not something you can tell by looking at it. Right. Anything else we want to talk about back here? I think that's it. Yeah. And we have these pieces here that are also a soft stop, and that's right behind the big buttons on the board back here. All right, so that might help take the pressure when you're pushing down hard on the buttons. So again, typical Fanatec, very neat and tidy, professional, you know, everything proprietary as far as their own circuit boards and all that good stuff. Wouldn't expect anything else here. Let me go ahead and flip this back in. I don't want to grab the wrong thing there, cause problems. Yeah, and there we go. All right. Now we're back together. <laughs> so now all I have to do is go ahead and put everything back together. And of course I will test it again to make sure I didn't muck anything up. I would not recommend you go in and do anything like this because you really don't need to, unless you know something goes wrong and you have a part that you can replace, which I sincerely doubt Fanatec's gonna let you do that. But again, this gives us a little more insight on how the wheel is working and its construct, how that relates to the performance when we're actually driving it. So yeah, we'll just get into the next segment. So now I'm just going to do a quick little video here on setting the bite point for the dual clutches. That is one of the features available on this GT3 wheel. Pretty simple stuff here. You want to make sure that you have the center dial over on the A. So if it was over here, it would be analog axis. That's not what we want on D. Then we have brake and throttle. We can use for brake and throttle, obviously. B is clutch and handbrake. We want A for clutch bite point. All right, so once we're in that, we're good to go. Now remember, you can store these in... All, one of the, all five of the setting slots. So you can have a different bite point for each setting in case you're going to a different track. They have different, as far as the grip on the trap, might be a little bit better than one of the other tracks. So anyway, make sure you're there and we're gonna go ahead and I'm in setting one. So I'm gonna go ahead and now I'm gonna pull in the left clutch. Now you can do either one. You can use the right clutch as your bite point, which I do, or you could use your left it doesn't matter. I'm going to use my left. So I'm going to pull that in. Then I'm going to take the funky switch here and press up once on it. And you'll see this display light up with a 100. So that's full clutch right now. I don't want that. I want to set my bite point. And what I'm going to do is roll that down. And I'm turning this counterclockwise to do that. And I know it's going to take a bit to do this. I'm going to put it on 65 to start with. I'm also going to put this in second gear. This is how I start this car in second gear. It's such a light car that it's really hard to control in first gear. Even with dual clutches, it's really hard to control. I found it's better to start off in second gear, and I got better times as far as my starts went. But you can do whatever you want to. So I'm going to pull in the left again. And notice how nothing's happening now when I'm pulling in the, the left clutch. 
and I'm going to pull in the bite point clutch and then I'm going to shift up to second gear. I'm going to give it full throttle while I'm holding both clutch pedals in and then I'm going to snap the right one out and then slowly ease out the other one and we'll see how that works. So let's go ahead and do that. So I'm not moving very, very fast here, am I? And I haven't even touched the second, rather the left clutch, which would be the second stage of the clutch. And that's because I don't have enough bite point in here. And you can, let me roll this back up to, well, hang on a minute. Let me get back into the mode here. There we go. If I roll this back up to 100, nothing happens. See, when I let the bite point out, it, nothing will happen until I let the other one out. So, I'm going to pull it back in, go back to my settings. And it was at 65 before, I wasn't getting much. I'm going to go down to 55 and see what happens there. So here we go. Still not moving very much. So I'm going to keep on going. I'm going to go down 10 point increments every time I do this. So I'm going down to 45 this time, see what happens. All right, pull them in. A little better there, but still not quite enough clutch engagement for me from what I want to do. So I'll go ahead and pull it in, set it up again. This time I'm going to go down to 35 and see what happens. Okay, here we go. Right out. So that was okay, but I think I can get more than 35 on that. To, I want to just not to spin the wheels. And right now it's not even spinning the wheels at all. So I'm going to pull it in. push it up and I'm going to go down to 30 and see what happens. Okay, here we go. Remember, I'm in second gear. If I was in first gear, this would be spinning like crazy. You see, now I'm spinning. <laughs> so obviously that's not what I want to do. Let's go ahead and turn it back around. There we go. And we'll get set back up. So that 30 was a bit much. So what I'm gonna do now is take it back up to, hang on, let me get my number back up. You gotta push this up every time. And you know, actually you can increment that way too. But to engage this, you have to push up every time to engage it. If you don't, it'll do whatever else is your function you have on this, which right now is my field of view. <laughs> so that's why you saw the field of view moving. Up again, I'm gonna go up to 37. See how that works. Here we go. Yeah, that's good right there, I think. Yeah. Let's try it again. And that way, I didn't get wheel spin that time, which is obviously what I want. And I was able to follow through with the second stage of the clutch and get a nice, smooth acceleration. And that's what I want without spinning the wheels. So here we go. Let me try it one more time just to make sure. In fact, um, I might put that down to 36 and see what happens. Because <laughs> you want to fine tune it, right? All right, no wheel spin. That's good. That's good. I'm going. Whoop. <laughs> All right, that was close. <laughs> All right. So anyway, you guys get the idea of what I'm trying to do here. I'm going to go back up to. I'm going to go back up to. 37. And we're going to try it one more time. In fact, let's go ahead and get around the corner here. Before we do that. Get on the smoother tarmac, too. It's kind of bumpy here on the concrete at Sebring. All right, so here we go. Now we're back at 37. I think that's what I liked the last time, so this could be it for me. Here we go. Yeah. Now, just to give you an example, let's get a, go ahead and go through the S turn here. We'll get back on the straight. And just to check, see the difference on first, we'll see what the difference is as far as first. And that's why I start in second, because first is so intense. It's just such an intense gear that it's really easy to spin out, even if you do it carefully. So I'm gonna go just on first, and we'll do what I have set up now and see what happens. So you can see right away I'm spinning. You can see my skid marks, if you can see that in the mirror up there. So 37 is way too much for that gear. 
So I'm going to go all the way up to like 55 and see what happens. How about that? <laughs> see, it, even with it set right to where it's not spinning, it's still hard to control it once you let all the way out on the second clutch and first gear. You really have to get second gear quick. So that's why I start out in second gear. I don't have any of those problems when I, as far as when you start in first gear. But you can also see the differences as far as when you're starting from first and when you're starting from second, what the different clutch as far as the bite points concerned is going to be as far as the numbers. And I wanted to show you both ways. So that's again why I start out in second. Of course, that's all subjective and you start out any way you want to. Now let's take a look at using these paddles that we were using for a dual clutch in the axis mode or brake and throttle mode or whatever you want to use an axis for. And we'll start with the brake and throttle. Now there's a preset. If we take this from the A and go over to C, it's brake and throttle. Now B is clutch and handbrake. So you can actually use this clutch over here and a handbrake over there. C is the default set if you're going to run a brake and throttle on here. And that's what I'm going to be using. Now we also have D. Now that's mappable analog axes. Now if we go to C, brake is on the left, throttle is on the right. And that's where I like it. But if you didn't want it to set up that way, you could just go to analog axes and then go in game and map whichever one. You could actually map the left over here as your throttle and the right as your brake, depending on, again, what you want. But I'm going to stick with the brake and throttle. And even if you don't want to use them for any for brake or throttle or clutch or whatever, you can still employ them as an axis in a game by going over to the D. So the Ds, you can do anything you want to. So we'll go back to C in the pre-mapping thing. Now I've already got this set up in iRacing. Simple matter of having it on C, going into the calibration utility in iRacing, and then calibrate. Simple as that. So let's get in and see how easy it is or difficult it is to drive. Now, I haven't done this much, so I'm gonna, probably not going to do too well. All right. And I keep putting, I keep trying to press the accelerator pedal and nothing happens, as you can see. I, if I go over here, there we go. <laughs> so, and again, using the shifters, um, again, it's one of those things that's kind of tricky. I think if you spend enough time on it, though, it shouldn't be a big deal. But we'll go ahead and hold the brake in, put it in first gear, and then I'm going to take off. And another thing is I keep forgetting to hit the accelerator pedal or accelerator paddle, if you will, when I'm finished braking, <laughs> like there. <laughs> so yeah, this is kind of tricky to do this. So we're, we go ahead and hit the brakes and then you're going to shift at the same time too and regulate your brakes at the same time. So this again is something you're going to have to spend some time with to get it right. <laughs> so the brake's getting a little grippy there, a little grabby rather. But yeah, it's easy on the straights because you just have the throttle paddle down and you're just going through the gears like you normally would. Yeah, this is, um, and I'm going in my braking zone. Too much brakes. <laughs> there we go. So anyway, easy enough to use these in this configuration if you for some reason need to and i think it's kind of nice that they actually included something like this in here this thing, this brake is really grabby i could probably tune the brake a little bit in the software too i think but yeah it's it's kind of a tricky thing to get used to especially if you've been using your feet all the time like most people do there we go i did that corner pretty good Let's see what we can do up here. Yeah, I'm, I'm probably going to be uh, adding a few seconds to my time here <laughs> by using it in this configuration. I think the big trick here is to become familiar with the brake because the brake is the hardest thing because you're just pulling it in and there's no real pressure like you do have in like a load cell brake, that kind of thing. So that's the hardest thing to, to regulate. You got to figure out where that brake is as far as when, when you're pulling it in, where you want it to be. Because you can see I was locking them up in the first few attempts at this. But now I'm kind of learning not to do that and grab that throttle. <laughs> Whoa. You know, if you ride a motorcycle, this really isn't that 
foreign because you're using your right hand for throttle and you're using well you don't use the use the left for clutch actually not throttle but it's not as foreign i guess if you've never ridden a motorcycle or something like that or one of these atvs i could see where you spend enough time on this you could get pretty good at it i think but i think that's probably all we need to do now to show you guys that it certainly does work and it's not hard to set up what you want here and yeah i kind of like that Fanatec has this set up this way. It's very simple to do the clutch. If you saw that part where I did the bite point set up for the clutch, very easy to do. You just got to find out where that point is, obviously. And then, of course, having these axes to be a brake throttle preset or clutch and handbrake. Or if you just want to do your own thing, you can go over to D and just set it up as you want. And I already had it set up as a brake over here on the right and a throttle on the left, and it worked just fine. So everything's working as it should as far as that goes. Now we're just going to get in and just drive and have some fun and use all the buttons and just see how the ergonomics of this wheel come together. So we're at Sebring again in iRacing, our usual base test. And we're in the Ferrari 488 GT3. And the first thing that you notice about a wheel when you're using it is the grips. And I really like the grips on this wheel. The overmolded rubber, it just feels good in hand. And I like the texture or the material that they're using in this rubber because it feels tacky, but it's not really tacky. And it's also good for wearing gloves. And I like to wear gloves just to prevent blisters on my hands for the most part. And yeah, this just feels good with your bare hand or your gloves. Although in the bare hand for long use, again, you probably get some blisters. But as you can see here, I'm able to maintain control of the car when I'm pushing it on the edge. And again, that's what a good grip in hand will allow you to do of course having the direct drive force feedback doesn't hurt <laughs> now the grip's fine the wheel overall when you're i have this thing running at 20 newton meters so i have it at all the torque it can give me and i have to say that this wheel doesn't feel as soft as i thought it would and remember this is an elite series so this is from their elite line and it's not supposed to be used in this fashion on podium series but they've manufactured this wheel to a point where they're even saying on their website, you can do this. Now, don't get me wrong. It's not going to replace a proper podium series type steering wheel or, you know, the aluminum spoke steering wheels that you can buy from Momo and things like that because it is made of plastic at the end of the day. So it does feel softer than my higher level wheels. But I tell you, at $200, it doesn't feel that soft. <laughs> it's just one of those things that I think that's punching above its weight a bit here, especially as a complete solution when you look at all the features we have here. Now it has the magnetic shifters, but I have to say definitely feel better than the other shifter, even though we're still on a rocker shifter. And that's just one of those things that I'm not crazy about, but you know, you can get used to anything. But yeah, having the magnetic element in there, so it, it gives you a nice tactile feel when you're doing the shift really makes a difference to the overall experience, to me anyway. And if you've ever used magnetic shifters, you probably know what I'm talking about. So yeah, a definite improvement on the shifter. And running this Club Sport quick release improves the stiffness between the motor shaft mount that I'm using, and of course, back to the wheel where we bolt it to the back of the wheel. Now, of course, that's where things are gonna get a little soft because it is plastic, like I said before. But yeah, not enough that it's delaying the the force feedback cues where I'm not getting enough of them to control the car. As you can see in that last, coming out of that last turn, it was all over the place, but I was able to maintain it. So yeah, I really don't have a lot to complain about. Again, at the price point it comes into, especially, it's just getting the job done. And the analog axis paddles do a great job too. I was able, if you saw that part of the review, able to dial in a bite point without too much trouble. And yeah, or you can use it for a throttle and brake or any way you want to use it. So they've done a good job making it easier to use these paddles and employ them in the functionality that you need as whatever you're doing as far as what you're driving. So again, 300 millimeters on this wheel, the open top, you know, this is a true GT type wheel design. This is a great wheel for any open wheel cars, tin tops, the prototypes, things like that. The only thing I wouldn't use it for 
would be oval racing, you know, of course, dirt racing, rally, stuff like that. Obviously, you need a rounder wheel for that, so you have some more to grab onto. But yeah, past that, this is one of those wheels that can cover a lot of your bases when it comes to sim racing. And again, I think it's a, it's probably one of the better values that I've seen in the Fanatec lineup. So yeah, I really can't complain too much about it when you, you think about everything that you get here and what it can do. And we can run it on any wheelbase we want to from Fanatec. Yeah, I think it's a pretty good deal. Final thoughts on the new version 2 McLaren GT3 wheel from Fanatec. Out of the box, the GT3 looks exactly like the previous version did, which is no surprise because this is an officially licensed wheel. I've always liked the way this wheel feels in hand with its molded rubber grips. It also feels stiffer than you would think a wheel from the Elite line would, but it does have a very wide plastic frame that helps give the GT3 that stiff feel. The button layout is the same as the old one, so nothing new to talk about there. With a good feeling 7-way funky switch, the user does have enough inputs for most to get what they need done. Most of the buttons are easy to reach from the grip position. The biggest changes on this new version of the GT3 wheel are on the back. With the older metal band cinching system being replaced by the new and much better tool-free quick release system. Even though it looks like the same rocker styled shifter setup, it is now a magnetic unit that has a better tactile feedback when actioned. The dual axis paddles have good spring tension and Fanatec has made it very easy to choose how you would like to employ them. From dual clutch to mappable axes, they can meet most racers needs. I had no issues quickly setting up a proper bite point when testing. I also took a shot at using the paddles for a throttle and brake instead of my feet. Now Fanatec states on their website that this GT3 can be used on their direct drive podium wheelbases without any problems. But if you want to use it in this way, you will need to swap out the Elite Quick Release for the Club Sport Quick Release. Or you could just cut the small pole off the Elite Quick Release so it will not action the torque limiter element on the wheel's circuit board. Once I was up and driving, I liked the way this new version reacted to the 20 newton meters of torque I was running. It didn't feel like it was being pushed beyond its limits. There was some felt flex or softness when compared to podium level wheels. But again, not anything that gave me concern that the wheel could not handle it. Overall, I think the GT3 is a good wheel design that can cover a lot of different cars without it feeling out of sorts when you're using it. Of course, you still would need a proper round top wheel for any dirt driving activities. At around $200, I think this is one of Fanatec's better values. I'm Barry Rowland. Thanks again for watching the Sim Racing Garage channel. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button. And if you would like to help support what I do here at the SRG, visit my website at simracinggarage.com.